Thursday. Welcome to the programme. We're going to do um, this story in uh, The Sun today. Sir Keir and Sir Ed in number 10, Nightmare on Downing Street. This is the headline uh, following uh, suggestions that the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, has left the door open to a coalition with the Liberal Democrats if and in the event of a Labour minority uh, administration at the next general election. In other words, if Labour doesn't win enough seats to have an outright majority and form a majority uh, government. Let's have a listen uh, to what Keir Starmer said to the BBC's political editor, Chris Mason, yesterday. No, no deal with the SNP. And I'll tell you for why, because there's a fundamental disagreement. I will never do a deal with a party that thinks that uh, the separation of the United Kingdom is the way forward and putting a border between Scotland and England. I do not believe that that is the way in which the United Kingdom will prosper and we'll never do a deal because of that. Would you ever do a deal with the Liberal Democrats? Well, look, I want to press on for a Labour majority. That's what we're aiming for. This is a hypothetical question. Well, so is the SNP one, but you answer that directly, but you're equivocal on the Lib Dems. It's a hypothetical question. I want, I've been clear. I want to press on for a Labour majority. It very clear then about ruling out any sort of deal with the SNP, with Philippa's party, but not with the Liberal Democrats. Why, why didn't Keir Starmer just rule that out too? Well, I think he, he said it there, didn't he? You know, the SNP want to break up the United Kingdom. We don't want to do that. The Lib Dems don't want to do that. And like Keir said, it is an entirely hypothetical question. You know, after last week's local elections, we are now the largest party in local government. Mm. We won 22 councils. The Tories lost 48. We are on the right track. People like what we're saying. We should be working for a Labour majority government, and that is what we are doing. Right, but you could go into coalition with the Liberal Democrats if you well, don't win enough seats at the next general election to have an outright majority. And that's not what we want entirely we want to win a majority and we want to be able to be in majority Labour government but like Kia said it's a hypothetical question you're not going to rule it out right it but you did is. but you did rule it out in terms well, of the coalition the Lib, with the SNP. The Lib Dems to want to break the United Kingdom up and you know we, we've never wanted to do that as a party so why would we go into power with someone who wants to do that it's very clear Keir Starmer doesn't want to and will not do any deal with your party uh, well, obviously, you know, Keir in the last uh, six months or so, I would say, has moved on, which is the new term for U-turns on many other things. So he says one thing now. Ah. He may say something different after the election. But and obviously... Change. and uh, Sure, yeah, and things change. John Curtis thinks that, in actual fact, the outcome of the local elections is more about Tory collapse than Labour surge. And they're predicting a hung parliament. Now, the message that Keir is sending right now to the party that has won the eight elections that have occurred since the Scottish referendum is unless you Scots vote how we tell you, you will have no voice in this government. You have no place to influence a UK government. That's not really a great signal to send out to protect the so-called precious union. I mean, I think if, if you look at the SNP, they're like the Tories, aren't they? They're coming Not up, even they're, slightly, their new Emma. First min, their new <laughs> First Minister is coming up with solutions to solve problems that his party created. Rishi Sunak is trying to come up with solutions to create problems that his party created. Isn't it time that we had someone else in government, a Labour government? Right. I mean, if that's the case, do you think Philip is right that actually as we get closer, perhaps, to a general election or even at the time of a general election, that Keir Starmer might change his mind and might indeed think about doing a deal with the SNP if he needs to? He's been very clear, no. So he won't change his mind. Well, there so you go. He, I mean, so he'd rather let the Tories into number 10 if the Liberal Democrats don't get enough to give him control of the House. He'd rather have the Tories in than even have any kind of relationship with the SNP when well, we have some of the most progressive social policies in the UK and therefore in a lot of things, social justice, there'll be very little disagreement between us. But it goes back to that fundamental, you know, I campaigned in the referendum to make sure that United Kingdom wasn't broken up. And that is something I feel incredibly strong about. More and strongly than lot, social justice now. And a lot now. of Labour MPs do, and a lot of people in the country do as well. I mean, if you remember, you didn't get the result you wanted in the referendum. We keep banging on about, but you didn't get the result you wanted. Right. I mean, Philippa, that sounds like you would be quite keen to do a deal uh, with a minority Labour administration but, in terms of what confidence and supply, what would be, yeah. what would be your price? Uh, well, obviously, it won't be me making that decision. It will come down to the first of minister course, at the but time. What, but what but Nicola like Sturgeon was very clear. Well, I think in the short term, there's devolution of things like uh, employment law, which we've seen some appalling actions here at Westminster. But of course, 
we would want the 2021 Scottish Parliament election, which gave a majority of Scottish parliamentarians in our parliament supporting a second referendum. And if Labour and Conservatives and Lib Dems believe in the union and are not afraid of that question, why are they denying Scots the right to make the choice over their own future when the UK has changed utterly since 2014 because of Brexit? Well, we're not afraid of it. You had your referendum, you just didn't like the outcome. That was pre-Brexit, Emma. The UK landscape is utterly different. Although you did say it was a once in a generation. There were no caveats. There were no there caveats nothing, at the time nothing, to say if things change, there was we'll nothing hold another one. in the Edinburgh Agreement that talked about once in a generation at all. I mean, Alec, the, the truth is, of course, whatever happens at the next general election, unless the Conservatives, and it looks very unlikely, um, get an outright majority, no one's going to do a deal with you. Certainly not the Liberal Democrats after coalition government, with you pretty well left them decimated. Oh, I think that's fair. I don't think mm. there's anybody in the House who the Conservative Party would deal with. I think or who would deal true, with you. Though, but I, 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 yeah, well, I mean, whichever way you look at it. But I, I think um, all I say is this. Uh, the former president, Lyndon Payne Johnson, said, first of all, the politics learn to count. Mm. This is the spring of 23. The autumn of 24 is probably when the election is going to be. Or to put it another way, six test matches, a European championship. I mean, two <laughs> You've summers. You've thought about There's this. There's a long, yeah. long way to go yet. Yeah, and things do change, as um, I think both um, panellists have just said. I mean, we have to only go back to recent history, um, Kate, to remember the 2015 general election and the damage that was done to Ed Miliband, who was the then Labour leader, in the campaign that the Tories ran about him being in the pocket of the... Uh, then SNP leader Alex Salmond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a long old, what, 12, 18 months to the next election, and I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about the possibility of this coalition rear with the SNP or the Lib Dems, a formal coalition or some confidence and supply. The interesting thing with both parties is what will their price be? We've heard a bit there from mm. Philippa. We've heard, haven't you, your party also talking about wanting to unpick parts of Brexit and kind of gleefully talking about how they're going to pull the strings of whoever's in power in number 10 next time because the, the likelihood would be that it would be a minority government of some form. And so I think we're going to see loads more scrutiny on what the SNP is saying, what the Lib Dems are saying and what price Labour and Keir might be willing to pay mm. for the keys to number 10. It's been a long time. They're desperate to get back in. Well, what could they give up to get and, there? And I just think that we keep talking about coalition, but of course there is supply and confidence. Absolutely. No, we mentioned that um, too. Approach. Yes. Yeah. I mean, why do you think that's more likely, a confidence and supply with Liberal Democrats? I mean, again, it's all hypothetical. Every panellist has said the general election is a long way off. A lot can change in that time. I think it's just, you know, who, who knows? I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been an MP 10 years and I've been up for election in that time four times and there's mm, been two referendums. Been busy. So anyone predicting what's going to happen in the next 12 months... Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's just the stark contrast, Emma, to anyone watching what mm. Keir Starmer said. Uh, he ruled out any sort of agreement with the SNP. That was clear. But he didn't when it came to doing any sort of deal with the Liberal Democrats. So, hypothetical, it may have been in both cases, but he was very adamant about one and not with the Liberal Democrats. And I don't know how many different ways I can say it. That's because the SNP fundamentally want to break the United Kingdom up and that's not something we want. And it's not something the people of the country want. And it's not something the Scottish people voted for either. And yet they keep voting for us. We keep winning elections. We are sitting at the majority of MPs in Scotland. And the message from that clip from Keir Starmer is unless you vote how we tell you, we won't be listening mm. to you. Yeah. That's quite a bizarre message yeah. to say. Well, We've already just, voted. I think there's one other factor. We talk about referendums. There was, of course, an AV referendum in 2011. That's the alternative which vote, which was and, looking at you know, other Starmer's forms of voting. Keir Starmer's made it clear that PR's not on the agenda or always. Did. So, I mean, again, when you talk about deals perhaps with the Liberal Democrats, there is a fundamental difference between Labour and the Liberal Democrats as there is a fundamental difference between Labour and the SNP. Right. I mean, of course, the other agreement that was made was with the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, which was under Theresa May, and that didn't end uh, very well either. They, they probably wouldn't look at any sort of supporting of the Conservative Party at the next general election. I don't think it's a credible um, coalition or, or partnership um, after what we saw last time. And I think in there is the example of where confidence and supply um, governments can easily fall down. I mean, effectively, that Conservative government never really was able to achieve anything mm. in that two and a half years. I mean, I've been an MP since 2010. I can categorically tell you that was the worst two and a half years of my 
professional career, no matter what I'd been in. It was horrific. Mm. And I don't think um, anything like that will be done by our party again. Right. Well, um, you mentioned, actually, that uh, something that Labour and the SNP might share is over taxation, over certain economic principles being progressive. Let's just show you uh, this headline in The Times. You saw Hamza Yusuf, the First Minister, in the headlines of the programme. He's to squeeze Scotland's middle class <coughs> with taxes on income and second homes, indicating that he wants to go further on taxes, creating a new income tax band for those earning over £75,000. Rishi Sunak, on the other hand, uh, the Prime Minister, is facing pressure from Conservative MPs, probably uh, like Alex Shelbrooke, to cut taxes, since there is the highest tax burden we've had uh, for 70 years. What exactly, explain to our viewers, do you mean, or does Hamza Yusuf mean, by progressive taxation? Well, the report from the Institute uh, of Fiscal Studies is very clear that actually Scotland has the most progressive tax and benefit system and in mean? the UK. Well, people at the lower end pay less tax, people at the higher end pay more tax than those south of the border. But what that results in is the lower tenth, when you put tax and benefit together, gain about £600 a year, mm -hmm. which is almost 5% uplift in income. The people in the top 10% end up paying about two and half thousand pounds more but that's an increase of 2.1 and in exchange for that if their kids are at university they're not paying tuition fees if their parents need home care they're not paying social care costs etc Mark, is it fair though that middle earners in scotland would be picking up even more of the tab well, I think, you know, describing 75 to 125,000 as middle earners, I mean, that's actually quite well off. I'm in there and I wouldn't begrudge paying more tax. The problem is that the Scottish government only have powers over less than a third of taxation. And income tax is a limited blunt tool. You haven't used because it, it's, but you haven't used it very often, have you? I mean, in well, terms of been, bearing taxes, it hasn't been something we've been the using government. it since 2016. But the, the problem is away. they don't control inheritance tax, capital gains tax, dividend tax, and of course the higher you put income tax, mm. the more you may drive people it, into that. And there, that's the problem. It, we don't control tax. Do you disagree with any of what you've just heard there from Philippa Whitford? I mean, we don't know what the exact plans are, but you well, know, those, but, those, those with the broader shoulders should pay more. And that's a principle that you know I've always believed in, mm -hmm. and that's something that my party firmly believes in. Right. So you share the sort of broad sentiment and principle that Philippa Whitford has uh, set out, well, and what is being implied by Hamza Yusuf? It's been a broad principle of the Labour Party for as long as I can remember, so that those with the broader shoulders yeah. should pay more. So why has Keir Starmer decided to drop his campaign pledge to increase taxes, income taxes, on the top 5% of earners? So I think we went through this last time I was on that. Kia oh, has I'm dropped. So sorry, it's we quite did that okay. Last time. No, no. <laughs> so Kia, Kia has dropped some of his pledges mm. because things change. So the principles remain the same, but policies I would expect to change. We've had we've had a pandemic. We've had fluctuations in government. So of course things are going to change. And we've been very clear that we'd set out our tax plans in advance of the next general election. But in the meantime, we've said we'd scrap non-dom status. We've said we didn't reduce the windfall tax. Right. I mean, those are relatively minor in terms of the sort of income it might uh, save or generate. Um, Alex Shelburne, what do you think? You are probably critical of Rishi Sunak in terms of the tax burden. Would you like to see tax cuts? I'd certainly like to see um, the economy stimulated through reducing taxation on business. Um, and um, I understand why um, the Prime Minister has taken the route he has. But, I mean, he himself has said that he hopes this is a temporary thing. But I think that it's a conversation in the government to how quickly can we start to reduce that burden on business. It's the opposite conversation elsewhere of how can we increase the tax burden. And I think that um, this is one of the fundamental problems because if we don't create the circumstances for businesses to grow and create more profit, then all we'll do, because we are going to spend more money, an ageing population, etc., mm. we're going to spend more money... We're just going to have to keep increasing taxes and, of course, we what? borrowed $138 billion last year. So, so, I mean, we're not even balancing the books. Is income tax too high at the moment? Well, I, I mean, as we saw, there, there is no great um, demand um, to cut the income tax rates. Of course, this government did cut the 45p threshold um, by 30 grand down. But I think, for my focus, it's about taxes on business. They're the ones who generate the income. They're the ones who are going to ultimately get more revenue in for the government and ultimately hopefully reduce taxation in other areas for people. But the fundamental taxes for me, which have to come down first, is that on business so that it can be reinvested 
reinvested into business, reinvested into people's wages, and, and ease, um, ease the burden in that sense. Philippa? Well, the thing is, actually, business depends also on public services. It depends on the health service for their workers. It depends on decent roads and rail. And actually, you need governments to invest in infrastructure, whether physical or digital. That also <coughs> stimulates business. And the problem that we saw with the, the last 13 years of austerity is it might look good in the Treasury balance sheets, but actually what it leads to is less spending by people in local economies, boarded up think... Hyde streets, and therefore fewer people being employed because people don't have money to go out and spend. Well, I wouldn't want the picture painted that there's been no infrastructure. I mean, Boris Johnson said as one of his key planks to increase um, superfast broadband, and he's taken that from 8% to 75% rollout across the country. So there is significant infrastructure for businesses going in. But where I no, do agree with it. Philip, no, no, absolutely, because I mean, obviously, there's still 25%, 25% there. Oh, I disagree when I look around my own city of Leeds. But the um, but the reality yeah. is, the reality is, is that um, Philip had just outlined about needing more money for public services. Mm. That increase is going to keep growing in. Um, and how should the that go come. on those who earn the most? But. It's not about who owns the most, it's about where you can get the most income from. You can get the most income from businesses being able to invest and generate more profits that the corporation tax then covers off. So how do you stimulate business to do that? Well, well you can also I mean, tax know. wealth and land ah, instead of well, just we'll, income, which is well, we'll come on to well, sidled taxes. away somewhere else. Uh, but do you Alex has heard of patriotic millionaires, a group of very wealthy people who are saying to the government on a regular basis, there's lots of wealth yet, it's just where it's held is the problem. And that's the Tories in a nutshell, isn't it? They're not prepared to redistribute money in a fair way, in a decent way, even when very rich people are telling them to do so. Right. I mean, but as I say, Keir Starmer isn't prepared to put up taxes. You want to tackle poverty. That is something that you have talked an awful lot about. What about the issue of wealth taxes? We haven't said we're not prepared to. We have said we will set out our tax plans in advance of the next general election. This is going to be one of the key battlegrounds, isn't it, at the next election? Difficult for all the parties. 100% key battleground. I mean, tax is sky high. My readers, your, your viewers, are clobbered with the highest rate of tax mm. since post-war. Meanwhile, public services are still feeling pretty squeezed. The economy is stagnant at best. And what we desperately need to do is try and have some, some vision for some ideas for how to kickstart that economic growth. I do wonder how much tax is too much tax for the SNP, because it starts to sound like no amount of tax would be too much tax, because you just fundamentally believe the state is better off spending that money than the individual. And I think that's where probably you, your politics and my paper's politics differ. Well, I, that, that's not the point. <coughs> I made the point that that's the only tax that they get to control in Scotland that relates to income or wealth. And I pointed out that actually income tax is a blunt tool because exactly if you start to go too high, people can stash it in uh, pockets that the Scottish government can't tax. And that's why you have to look at things like wealth and land, ah. but we <coughs> don't control those taxes. Would you like Labour to look at the issue of wealth taxes? Um, taxes on capital rather than on earnings? I would like us to look at wealth taxes and their conversations I'm having with our front bench. You know, at the end of the day, oh. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a backbencher. I know. You know, I'm, I'm not setting this policy, but I can try and influence where I can. And all I know is that if you look through history, every single Labour government makes sure that there's fairness injected into the system. At the minute, it's not fair. And I can guarantee that last time we pulled people out of poverty, we'll do it again. But can I just ask, what is a land tax? You keep talking about land tax. What is the land <coughs> tax? What is your aim on that? Well, uh, well, I mean, that's I'm in the wrong parliament, Alec. I'm down here with you. I'm not in Holyrood. But basically, these are things that we should be looking at because people can can hoard money in property, in land, and it doesn't get taxed. We, it's mostly on income. And we're not hitting people enough with capital gains and other things when what they're selling farming? and dealing in property. What about farming? Because, I mean, in the early 90s, 0% inheritance tax put on farms, which allowed family farms to stay within and not lose them being broken up through inheritance tax. Is that what we're talking about well, with the land tax? Well, obviously, you look at the policy in detail. I'm not going to try and create SNP policy here, but what I'm saying is income tax, which is the main one that the, S the Scottish Government have control over, is limited. Down here, the UK government have control of all the other taxes and they're not using them to be fairer and constantly using it as an excuse to go back to austerity 
actually strangles local economies, and then you get less tax return. You were shaking your head um, as Joanna was talking about increasing wealth taxes, perhaps equalising capital gains tax with uh, income tax uh, rates and thresholds. What would your readers think about that? I just think that anybody going into a next election saying let's raise taxes even higher, let's create new forms of taxation, is probably going to be met by a lot of disappointment on the doorstep. People already feel very overtaxed. They pay a lot on their on their housing, on their income, and they just can't afford to pay more. That's how they feel, that's how my readers feel. Any, and yet, as should be paid. Yeah, yeah. And, a, and a lot of people in polls actually suggest they would rather <coughs> see more taxation <coughs> if they're in that <coughs> higher group so that they can rely on public services rather than having to replace them by paying privately.